Wonderful. Well, I'm not sure if that came through, but I will start over. Um, welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have you all here at this event with Dolby, creating podcasts in Dolby Atmos. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Sav. I'm the Chief Creative Officer and a co-founder here at Pod People. Um, we are a podcast production and staffing company uh, empowered by a global community of creators uh, and audio professionals all over, um, many of you whom are here today. For those of you who aren't already a part of the community, um, please go to our website and join. Uh, you'll get events and newsletters and uh, access to our professional network on Circle. Um, we'd love to have you join. Um, Dolby, I think, goes without introduction. They create audio, visual, and voice technologies for movies, TV, gaming, and now podcasts. With this revolutionary new technology, Dolby Atmos, um, they're bringing spatialized audio uh, all of those spaces, and uh, we couldn't be more excited to share that today with you. Um, I know that for me, I first came uh, into uh, knowing about uh, Dolby Atmos when I was at a podcast movement. It must have been, you know, a podcast movement or two ago, and it really is a, a game-changing technology that, you know, takes this ability to spatialize audio in 3D and brings it to the everyday producer and sound engineer and sound designer. So. Um, I'm going to introduce Tom McAndrew now. Tom is a senior technical manager uh, for content relations at Dolby. He's been working with the technology back when they were doing uh, the technology on disks, and uh, he's helped bring it into the, the golden age now with uh, this new Dolby Atmos technology, uh, enabling it for you know streaming platforms like Netflix and now for podcasts. So um, without further ado, here's Tom to kick things off. Thanks, Matt. I really appreciate the great intro, and uh, thanks to you and uh, everybody from Pod People for uh, welcoming us today, um, and everyone who's attending. Um, we got uh, great attendee numbers. It's a really fantastic turnout, and uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending. And uh, I'm going to do a presentation, and then I'm going to do a little technical demo at the end, um, and then after that, I'll do some uh, live Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to ask along the way, Go ahead and put them in the Q and A chat, and uh, then we will uh, we'll get to them, uh, you know, toward uh, toward the end of the presentation. So, um, so we've been officially working with the podcast community for a little over a year now, um, and probably a year and a half ago, we started getting rumblings um, just in like the Facebook Atmos Mixing Professionals forums. I started noticing, hey, there are people saying, hey, you know, we deliver in stereo, but I'm really enjoying using the Dolby Atmos mixing tools, and that's when we kind of realized geez, we're behind the curve on this. People are using the Dolby Atmos tools. Let's actually start enabling podcasting in Dolby Atmos. And uh, so, like Matt said, we've been working officially with the podcast community a little over a year now. And the, um, you know, the rate of interest and adoption has been amazing. We started off a podcast movement in Nashville a little over a year ago with people going, oh, what the heck is Dolby Atmos? And uh, then we attended the podcast show uh, London this spring, and people were like, yeah, we're thinking about Dolby Atmos. And uh, now, uh, Podcast Movement in Dallas just a couple weeks ago, um, the interest we got was, hey, I want to do Dolby Atmos now. It's the, the curve has been just amazing. And uh, that's why we're all here today, to just learn more about it. So, um, and we're working with pop people specifically to in increase the, uh, the breadth of mixers um, who know how to work in Atmos uh, to meet the demand of podcast companies who want to deliver in Atmos. Because we actually started hearing from some podcast companies who are doing Atmos, hey, there aren't enough mixers out there. Dolby, help us out, meet that demand. And we're really thrilled that uh, Pod People is uh, doing that alongside of us. So uh, enough intro. Let me go into my uh, settings here and open up the slideshow. And I'm going to assume everybody can hear, see this. And so here we go. Um, so people have heard about Dolby Atmos for a, a little over uh, 10 years now. Uh, Dolby Atmos started out in the cinema, and um, from that we moved on to home entertainment. And it was still uh, feature films, uh, largely on shiny disc, Blu-ray and Ultra HD Blu-ray. And then uh, after feature films on disc, then we went to uh, streaming originals. And most of the major streaming services uh, in the U.S. and many, many around the world are Dolby Atmos capable. So Netflix, and Disney Plus, and HBO Max, and Paramount Plus, and Amazon Prime Video, uh, and more are all delivering content enabled with Dolby Atmos. Um, and live sports. Um, starting out in Europe, uh, hundreds and hundreds of soccer games now, uh, or as they say football, um, have been delivered in Dolby Atmos live to consumers, 
Uh, and here in the U.S., there's been a lot of uh, sports that have started popping up in Atlas as well. Uh, somebody at NBC Sports, I went to Notre Dame because every Notre Dame home football game is available in Dolby Atmos on Comcast and also on DirecTV. Uh, and there have been experiments with the Olympics and uh, lots of other types of sporting events. Um, and then Dolby Atmos Music. So that's been around for a couple of years now uh, on several music streaming services. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But finally, here we are with podcasting. Um, and we're so excited that the podcast community is embracing the creative potential of Dolby App. Um, so why Atmos for podcasting? It really does transport the listener into the story. Um, and we started out kind of with narrative fiction podcasts, but now uh, documentaries and true crime and quite a few other music genres, or excuse me, podcasting genres are now available with Atmos. So uh, let's hear what some folks have to say about Atmos for podcasting. Uh, Marshall Louie from Chief Creative Officer from Wondery he said the audio landscape is evolving quickly and listeners are growing more accustomed to podcasts that push the limit of how stories are told. And, you know, he says you can leverage Dolby Atmos to showcase the incredible sound design and innovate for listeners. Um, you know, there are so many great podcasts out there. Sometimes it's hard for podcasters to cut through and really get their programs noticed. Um, and we openly admit without great storytelling, great technology is nothing. But we absolutely believe that great technology can enhance great storytelling. And uh, here's what some other podcast creators have to say. Um, Robert Eggers, he calls it transportive. Um, Rob Herding from Q Code. Dolby Atmos is an extremely powerful tool that allows artists to unlock another dimension of audio only storytelling. Uh, and Chris Terry from Gen Z Media, he said uh, Dolby Atmos really helps because we can move people in ways that allow us to travel with them. So those are pretty powerful statements over the creative possibility of Dolby Atmos. So Atmos is already available uh, on several podcast services around the world. Uh, here in the U.S., Wondery Plus, um, in India, Earshot and Times of India, um, in the Middle East and throughout Europe, Angami, and also Spice Screen, they are all delivering Dolby Atmos-capable experiences to consumers today. Uh, and the industry really is noticing the difference. Uh, the left-right game from Q-Code actually won the award, uh, the Ambi Award for Best Production and Sound Design. Uh, and then this year, uh, Iowa Chapman and the Last Dog from Gen Z Media, uh, they were award nominated for best production and sound design as well. So at Dolby, we did our own research and uh, here's what folks are saying. We surveyed 780 consumers. We hired a polling company. We didn't want to put our thumb on the scale and uh, we had them uh, you know, play some sample content to see what people thought. And out of the almost 800 people who listened to podcast demo clip in Dolby Atmos, 87% received it better than the typical listening experience. Over half of them thought it was much better. And that same 87% are interested in listening to podcasts in Dolby Atmos all the time. So we think that's really meaningful and you know it's, it's huge. It really speaks to the power of what the technology can do. So uh, let's step back a little bit and just talk about the core of the technology. So what is Dolby Atmos? So, we hear the real world in three dimensions. Things happen all around you, above you, behind you. That's the way we experience the real world. Um, but entertainment sound has always been confined, confined to channels. So in the beginning, there was mono, and it was good. It wasn't great, but it was good. Uh, and then we went to stereo, and then 5.1, and then 7.1. And you know, when we developed Dolby Atmos, you know, those were all channel-based schemes. We didn't want to just create another channel-based format, like go, oh, um. 9-1, let's call it a day. We wanted to do something that was a little bit more true to real life, uh, more immersive, and also true to creative intent. So there are a couple of things that are special about Dolby Atmos. Uh, number one, sound happens all around you, just like in real life. Um, and that happens with overhead speakers or virtualization. And also, instead of sound being channel-based, sound being mixed to speaker channels, Sound is what we call object-based. That is, pieces of sound are referred to as audio objects. And the reason for object-based audio instead of channel-based audio is that every listening environment is different in terms of number of speakers and location of speakers, um, or if you're listening on headphones. Um, but with object-based audio, the object metadata travels with the mix to the playback environment because every playback environment is different, whether it's a home theater system, or a smart speaker, or a car, or yes, we're gonna talk about cars, uh, or a mobile phone, every listening environment is different. But the decoder in each environment knows how many speakers there are and where they are. 
So audio objects don't always come out the same speaker channel. They always come out the correct point in space, uh, which in one room might be one speaker, another room might be another speaker, combination of speakers, or virtualized to a psychoacoustic location binaurally. So Dolby Atmos always gives you the truest uh, creative intent, and that's that's the power of what Atmos brings to the party. So just to give you an idea of an audio object, here's a cute little bird, and he exists in space. Instead, he doesn't always come out a speaker channel. His position is defined by X, Y, and Z coordinates. Uh, another object uh, parameter is size. So say you have a mono track of a rainstorm. Well, you can take that rainstorm, you can put it on the ceiling, and you can open up the size parameter, and yet you're now filling that entire ceiling plane with sound. So that's just uh, a couple examples of the power of object-based audio. So when people think about Dolby Atmos, especially in the early days, people think about Atmos and cinemas. You had speakers all around the room and two rows of speakers overhead. Um, and then when Dolby Atmos came home a few years later, um, the first thing people would think about is higher end home theater systems with speakers all around the room, just you know, a spouse acceptance factor nightmare. Um, but that is not the state of Dolby Atmos today. There are over one and a half billion devices in consumers' hands that are capable of delivering a Dolby Atmos experience. From traditional living room systems to smart speakers and game consoles, sound bars, mobile phones, laptops, tablets, all of these can deliver Atmos experiences to customers. Um, and I promised I'd talk about it, Atmos and cars. Um, this is really exciting to us because a car is a perfect environment for immersive audio, and frankly, it's hard for the consumer to screw it up. The speakers are bolted in place at the factory. So we know people get great experiences uh, with Dolby Atmos and cars, and Atmos is already in cars from Lucid Motors, Neo, which is a Chinese company, also sold throughout Western Europe, uh, Lee Automotive, Mercedes-Benz, and literally just announced today, Polestar Motors. So Dolby technologies always start high end and then go down into mainstream. And Dolby Atmos for cars is already starting to penetrate mainstream, uh, particularly with the Chinese brands, but we have more announcements coming. So we're very, very excited about the automotive potential. So let's talk about scaling to consumer devices um, and specifically binaural. Binaural is cool. And a lot of podcasts are mixed and distributed in, in binaural. And binaural is really cool for headphones but the thing is, binaural is only cool for headphones. This, the experience can frankly kind of break when it plays out speakers because a binaural track that comes out two channels, it uses phase and delay and EQ to fool your brain when you're wearing headphones into thinking things are happening around you. But those same psychoacoustic cues when they're played out speakers, um, the experience kind of breaks. And so that's why Dolby Atmos is beyond binaural because in addition to headphones, Dolby Atmos delivers a great experience and, again, delivers the truest creative intent to all those different types of consumer endpoints. So uh, now let's move into a uh, professional ecosystem and uh, the tools that people are delivering Dolby Atmos. So um, I talked about the concept of audio objects. Uh, I'm also going to mention audio beds. So a Dolby Atmos mix can be composed of objects, like I already explained, and also beds. And beds are the channel-based portion of the mix. That is actually sound mixed to speaker channels. And the beds in Dolby Atmos are 9.1, traditional home theater 7.1, and then left total overhead and right total overhead. So Dolby Atmos mix can be uh, comprised of a mixture of beds and objects, or mostly beds, and just a few objects, or primarily objects, and no beds at all. It's uh, just up to the... Uh, creative thoughts of the mixer and how they want uh, to deliver their mix. So when people are thinking about, eh, maybe I'll do Atmos, or you know what, I'm going to get this show out the door in stereo, and then I'm going to go back and remix into Atmos. And we say, nay, nay, because working in stereo and then remixing in Dolby Atmos, it's basically a total teardown and you're starting over again. Um, but with the Dolby Atmos first workflow, you actually get a better creative mix in Dolby Atmos. And what mixers tell us is that they actually like, say, their 5.1 or their stereo mix that is automatically derived from Dolby Atmos better than if they had set out to do, say, a stereo mix. When you get to play in that three-dimensional volume and, and mix with audio cues in those interior spaces, 
the automatically rendered uh, down mixes or re-renders from the Atlas Master, mixers actually prefer those to if they had originally creatively started out mixing in stereo. So we think that's one powerful reason among many to always work Atmos first, even if uh, you don't have your Atmos distribution plan squared away. So now let's look at a, just a high level view of the Dolby Atmos workflow. So Atmos starts in a digital audio workstation and I'll get to all the different audio workstations uh, that are capable of mixing in Dolby Atmos. And you do your mix, you, you know, your sound design, your edit, your mix in the workstation. And then all of the components of the audio, your beds, your objects, and your object metadata go to the Dolby Atmos renderer. And the Atmos renderer does two things. It number one, renders the sound into the listening space, and that may be in speakers, and it may be binaurally. Now, speaker-wise, for sound for picture, we strongly recommend that uh, audio mix rooms for Atmos be 7.1.4. That is 7.1 and then four speakers overhead. For podcasting, we know that uh, budgets and timelines don't necessarily support working in that kind of room, and so smaller speaker counts are okay. Um, but also podcasters are mixing Dolby Atmos binaurally. So the Dolby Atmos renderer actually has a binaural output. So I know I just finished saying, oh, you don't want to release in binaural, but mixing and QCing in binaural is absolutely a valid workflow if all you have to work with is headphones. Uh, and Dolby has also recently uh, developed a uh, tool that's currently in beta, and it is a mobile phone app that delivers a personalized uh, binaural experience for mixers. So it's a phone app, and what you do is you just take an image of your head, and you send that image up to the cloud, and it renders your personal binaural file, and you download, you download that personal file, and you load it into the Dolby Atmos renderer, and you then get optimized, personalized binaural rendering for your noggin. All right? So the Dolby Atmos renderer, again, it does two things. It renders the audio into the listening environment, and also it is where your Dolby Atmos master file is written and the renderer can create your Dolby Atmos master file. And once you have an Atmos master file, the renderer can automatically and faster than real time render out any sub-deliverables you need, like a stereo mix or stems or an m and &E, that is a music and effects track for if you're gonna do something like an international language dub. Uh, the renderer can automatically export all that from an Atmos master file. Now, there are two different types of a Dolby Atmos renderer. There is say the Tesla and the Kia. Not that there's anything wrong with Kias, but uh, the Tesla version is the Dolby Atmos mastering. It runs on its own hardware, it runs on its own computer, and then it's connected to your digital audio workstation computer via MADI or Dante IO. So this is what you're gonna work on if you're mixing like a giant Marvel feature. For 99% of use cases, the Dolby Atmos mastering suite is not necessary. That's where the Kia comes in. So the Dolby Atmos production suite, it's software only, it runs on the same machine as your digital audio workstation, and it's optimized for all but the most complex uh, mixing uh, environments. Um, it's available on the Avid store. Regular price is uh, almost $300, uh, but for current uh, Pro Tools users, um, they're running a special right now where it's 99 bucks. Um, and to be clear, Dolby is not trying to sell Dolby Atmos renderers. We kind of give away the, um, the content creation tools in order to, dr to drive uh, consumer electronics um, decoder licensing. That's kind of our business model. So anyway, you have the Dolby Atmos Mastering Suite or the Dolby Atmos Production Suite. Um, and again, the renderer helps you master once and optimize for any downstream need. So let's talk about the specific digital audio workstations that work with uh, Atmos rendering. So first of all, Avid Pro Tools, that is the OG, that's what people started out mixing Dolby Atmos on, and that's probably how most people are delivering Dolby Atmos. So with uh, Pro Tools, you do need either the Dolby Atmos Mastering Suite or the Production Suite Renderer. The Pro Tools also includes a non-real-time offline render. So once you finish your mix, you can press a button and go to lunch and you can come back and your mix is uh, print mastered. Um, it can also import Dolby Atmos master files and turn them back into a Pro Tools session so that you can mix and you can make creative changes to your Atmos master. Uh, and also there is a separate um, Dolby Atmos music panner that is compatible with the uh, Pro Tools workflow. Uh, next is uh, Steinberg, Nuendo, and Cubase. Um, it works with Dolby Atmos mastering suite and production suite. 
But like the rest of the DAWs I'm about to talk about, you don't need the Dolby Atmos renderer tool. Like I said, we're not trying to sell renderers. So it actually has native rendering capability built right into the tool, and it can import as well as what they call author or you know print master uh, Dolby Atmos master files. Um, and if you want to use the Dolby Atmos music banner, you can do so. Next is Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve. Uh, once again, it works with Mastering Suite and Production Suite, although you don't need those because it also includes native rendering capability. It can import and export all the different Dolby Atmos uh, master file types. There's a whole acronym soup of uh, file types, and we can go into that if anyone has questions in the chat. Um, and it can also import master files uh, to a timeline for QC and cut-only editing. So it will actually play master files without turning it back into a resolve session. Um, and for those who are working in IMF, that is the interoperable media format, it's mostly a sound for picture thing. Companies like Netflix are starting to deliver an archive in IMF. It can, uh, it can deliver immersive audio bitstream files that will go inside an IMF package. And last but not least, the most colorful digital audio workstation is uh, Apple Logic Pro. Uh, once again, it works with um, Mastering Suite and Production Suite, but you don't need them. It also includes native rendering. It can import and export ADMB waves, uh, and it works with Dolby Atmos Music Panner as well. So several different digital audio workstation uh, options uh, for working Dolby App. Uh, plugin support. There are lots of different plugins um, that can help uh, help you create a Dolby Atmos experience. These are just two examples, and we like to point them out as examples of, for example, the isotope exponential uh, uh, reverbs are great for spatializing in three dimensions, filling out all your bed tracks with uh, dialogue reverb. So going to three dimensions, making somebody's voice sound like they're in a wood paneled office or a metal walled spaceship. Uh, this plugin can do it and it can do it in 3D, including overhead. Uh, likewise, New Gen Halo is a great uh, upmixer, uh, primarily for music, taking stereo or 5.1 music and using it to fill out all of your bed tracks, including the overheads. And then uh, I'll also mention briefly the Dolby Atmos conversion tool. This is kind of our uh, Swiss Army knife tool that uh, allows you to take Dolby Atmos master files and uh, you can frame rate convert them. You can change file types. You can convert from one Atmos master file type to another. You can trim files. You can pad files like appending or prepending with silence. Uh, you can uh, concatenate chunks together. Uh, this was used typically for uh, film reels, uh, but there are other applications as well, like perhaps putting a head or tail logos onto your show. Um, and it's free. So developer.dolby.com, you can uh, download the Dolby Atmos conversion tool. It's available for Mac, PC, and Linux. Uh, the Linux version is command line only. So, okay, say you want to build a Dolby Atmos mix room. What does that look like? A lot of people are afraid it looks like this. Um, it's actually not the case. Uh, it's a lot easier. Um, some Dolby Atmos mix rooms are fairly high end, like uh, at Capitol Studios in Hollywood, they have an amazing uh, PMC speaker package. Uh, I believe they are 9.1.6 uh, in terms of speaker load. Uh, more typical uh, near field mix rooms are like the one in the top right. But then in the bottom, once again, you can mix Dolby Atmos podcasts on headphones. So. You want to upgrade your mix room to Dolby Atmos. How do you do it? So we actually give you all the tools in terms of documentation and guidelines to figure it all out. So um, if you go to our website and you can scan that QR code that'll take you to our website where you can download these assets, we have a couple of things. We have number one, our Dolby Atmos room design guide, and that is a document that gives you all the specs for optimizing an Atmos mix room uh, for speakers. So minimum, maximum recommended room volumes, uh, angles from the listening position to the speakers, uh, noise floors, everything you need to know about an optimal Dolby Atmos room is in that package. Uh, and then also if you want to build a, a speaker-based room, we have our DART uh, spreadsheet, which is Dolby Atmos Room Design Tool. It's an interactive spreadsheet that's preloaded with most of the major uh, makes and models of speakers and amplifiers and you plug in the speakers and amps that you're considering, you plug in your room volumes and your distance to speakers, and it will then calculate basically like a green light, yellow light, red light, in terms of if what you've chosen is appropriate for the space that you've defined. So all that's available on our website. So Dolby Atmos Podcasts, D 
deepen your audience's connection to their favorite content and your service platform or device. Uh, and if you scan this QR code, that will take you to an immersive podcast experience in Dolby Atmos where you can actually hear sample content uh, over headphones. So I'll give you a second to uh, park on that. And then I'm going to hop out of the PowerPoint and go into Pro Tools and the Dolby Atmos renderer. And I'm going to walk you through some of the features of Pro Tools and the renderer. So let me come out of here and I'm going to have to push some buttons in the uh, Blue Jeans UI. There it is. Now going to share this screen. Minimize this. Okay. So what you're seeing right now is Pro Tools as well as the Dolby Atmos renderer panel. Uh, the first thing, if you're using Pro Tools and you want to create a Dolby Atmos mix session, the first thing you're gonna do is tell Pro Tools, hey, I'm working in Atmos. So in the setup window, you go into peripherals, and then the very last tab in Pro Tools says Dolby Atmos. And you're going to click that enable box, and you're gonna choose the renderer host. So for Dolby Atmos production suite, it's the local machine. It's the same machine that the renderer is on. Um, and so you'll select it there. And you will then go into setup again, and in your playback engine, you're going to choose the Pro Tools Gazauta. And in that case, it's the Dolby Audio Bridge. Dolby Audio Bridge is basically the communications bus between Pro Tools and the Dolby Atmos renderer, and it's automatically installed when you install the renderer. So our playback engine is the Dolby Audio Bridge, so that's all good. And then in the Atmos renderer, I'm going to go into my preferences, and what's my audio input device? Just like you're going out of the Dol of Pro Tools through the Dolby Audio Bridge, you're going into the renderer with the Dolby Audio Bridge. So that's all happy. Uh, now, the renderer panel itself, um, the purple box here represents the bed tracks. In this case, so we have a single bed set. So left, center, right, pair of sides, pair of rears, subwoofer, and stereo overheads. Um, if you want to stem out your beds, you can do that. You can have separate bed sets for dialogue, music, and effects, however many uh, bed sets you, got, you want to stem it out, you can do that. However, the more tracks you use for beds, you're cutting into your available object lanes. Um, and you can have up to 128 tracks in a Dolby Atmos recorder session uh, between all of your beds and all of your objects. So right now I'm set to stereo monitoring, and you see uh, left and right there. Um, however, if you have a speaker system, say 7.1.4, you can open up your monitoring outputs and your metering to 714. But since I'm working on my laptop, I'm going to stay in stereo. Now, this view here is a 3D representation of the room. This is the actual mix room, and every individual audio object in the mix is going to be represented by a little green ball that occupies space in your three-dimensional area. Um, and some of the balls will just be small, and some of them will kind of have a halo around them. Those represent the objects that are manifesting with size. So going back to Pro Tools, uh, so this Pro Tools session is a, a Dolby demo piece. And um, the first set of tracks, all the green tracks here, these are my beds. So again, left, center, right, sides, rears, big fat one is the subwoofer, and then our overheads. And then every track below it, is an object track. And every object track has a Dolby Atmos panner on it like this. So, you know, I don't like that one. I'm gonna to go to a different one. Atmos panner like this, there we go. Um, so, as I move the ball around the room, you can see in the renderer that there's a little blue ball moving along with me. And there are different ways that you can move things around and you can manipulate the size parameter. For example, if I take the size slider and then, or excuse me, uh, open it up, it's going to expand the size of that audio object. Some of these panners uh, don't like having a height for some reason. We'll sort that out later. But anyway, um, 
That is the Atmos Panner. Um, that is a Pro Tools session. This is the renderer. I've just taught you how to mix Dolby Atmos in five minutes. Um, I'm being glib, but the thing is, I like to think the Dolby Atmos tools are really powerful, but they're not really complex. If you already know how to mix in, say, 5.1, you already know how to use the 5.1 Panner, uh, you already know how to write uh, automation in a digital audio workstation, then Dolby Atmos gives you the tools that you're already familiar with using, but it gives you more creative options. So anyway, if I hit uh, play on this session, now obviously you're not hearing uh, Dolby Atmos over blue jeans. However, you're seeing a visual representation of the mix that's in this session. Now, uh, before we jump out to Q&A, there's one other thing I want to show you. It's one of my favorite features in the renderer. If you are working in headphones, we do still recommend that at some point you listen to your mix on speakers. It doesn't necessarily need to be in a professional environment. It could be a consumer environment like a living room system or a, an Atmos capable sound bar. And the way to do that quickly and easily, as soon as you finish creating your Dolby Atmos master file, up in the file window, one of your options is export audio. And the MP4 option allows you to take your Dolby Atmos master file encode it into Dolby Digital Plus, which is the codec that actually streams to consumers, and it wraps it in an MP4 container. You can then take that MP4 file, put it on a thumb drive, put it in a TV or in a Blu-ray player, and then you can actually play that file in that consumer system right away. So it's, it's kind of the Dolby Atmos equivalent of, and I'm gonna date myself now, once you finish mixing a song in stereo, running it off to a cassette and then running out to your driveway and sticking it in the cassette player in your car. So it's immediate feedback, on how your mix sounds in a consumer environment. You don't have to publish it to a podcast platform to wait to hear how it sounds. So that is uh, my uh, demonstration. I'm going to come out of here and I'm going to go into the Q&A. And uh, let's see here. Thank you, John. <laughs> I saw it, uh, why my height wasn't working. What headphones are good for Atmos mixing? Um, like Sony MDR, for example. Burl, uh, thank you for your question. and. Honestly, um, you don't need a specific brand or kind of Atmos capable uh, headphones. Uh, any decent quality headphones that you're familiar with, that you're comfortable with, that you enjoy using, uh, those are great for working in Dolby Atmos. And uh, by the way, uh, Aisha's camera just turned on. This is Aisha Emerson from uh, Dolby, and uh, she's assisting with our Q&A here. And uh, Aisha set up this uh, whole event with podcast pe or pod people. So Aisha, how are you doing? Hello, Tom. Hello. Of course, even after however many years of uh, video chatting, you need to unmute. So, Great. yes, there are lots of questions. So, thank you for answering that first one, and we can keep diving on in. Uh, did you have more to add to that? Uh, no. Now I think I'm just going to start uh, marching down the questions. And again, folks, please uh, go ahead and put questions into that Q and A, and we will uh, we'll get to them as they come up. So, uh, Aaron, Tom, uh, let me read this for you, so you can keep keep on track. So. Okay. Can you explain the different types of binaural encoding in the renderer? There's off, near, mid, and far. This is that's for a, objects. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, but so the uh, binaural render um, isn't just you know a set three-dimensional sphere. There are actually uh, parameters for each uh, track, each object track that you can set so that you can make objects sound like they're very near, like someone's whispering in your ear, or mid, which is kind of the default, or far, like someone is actually far away. So instead of just making it quieter to suggest that it's far, um, the binaural output or the binaural decode from an Atmos uh, stream, will someone will actually sound far away instead of just quiet. So those near, mid, and far, or off parameters exist on each object track. Um, it's not dynamic. Um, you have to set it for that track, and then that is the parameter for that track for the entire run of show. So if you want to set up a group of objects that are all near, a group that are all mid, and a group that are all far, you can do that. But, um, but they are static for the duration of the show. Um, and that is a setting in the, uh, in the renderer setup. So thank you for that question. Perfect. Aisha, what do you got uh, next? What headphones are good for Dolby Atmos mixing? All right. Uh, I think I started answering that one earlier. Um, 
honestly, any headphones that you're comfortable with. If they're headphones you're familiar with, you know how they perform, you know how they translate, um, I'd say use those. Uh, we don't recommend specific brands necessarily, but you don't need specific like Atmos headphones. You can use uh, whatever you like. Great, yeah, fully agree. And this is a fun question that we love. When will Pro Tools have native Dolby Atmos mastering? Um, it already has uh, master, like non real time mastering, but um, you know, honestly, that's up to Avid. They control their own uh, timeline for uh, new features they're deploy deploying. Um, we're very actively involved in uh, Av or with Avid, and they're great partners with us. But uh, that's up to them to decide uh, when they're going to implement and uh, announce. But uh, they have uh, the kits they need to make it happen. But they're you know they're busy folks and they have a lot of feature requests um, you know for other lesser technologies. But um, you know they will get to it uh, as soon as they can. I you know we know that uh, Avid is aware of uh, of the request. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. And is there a roadmap to have Dolby Atmos in more podcast platforms like Spotify or Google Podcasts? Boy, I hate to keep being cagey. <laughs> it's it's up to them to announce. Um, we're talking to lots of major podcast platforms. We've been having uh, meetings and scoping and doing test projects and bringing demos to these companies. And um, I think there's going to be some exciting announcements in the near future. But uh, for now, Wondery Plus uh, is the one partner that we have here in the U.S. Uh, and they've been amazing partners. But uh, more are coming. There is another announcement uh, pretty darn soon, and we're really excited about that one coming out. But uh, there's there's many more to come. Absolutely. Yeah, and but Tom. Once, gonna... once again, it's for those it's for those companies to announce. Right, and I'll even add to Tom's answer and say, you know, we have several regional platforms enabled in Dolby Atmos today, including Angami in the Middle East and North Africa, as well as several platforms in India, such as um, Earshot, Spice Screen, and Times of India. So next question, is there a way to demo my Dolby Atmos mix on my iPhone before it's published? Uh, yes, there is. You can uh, take that uh, uh, MP4 file that I told you about and sideload it to files on your iPhone. And then from files, you can play that audio file. Right. Now, Tom, this is a little bit of a longer question, but I think Bring we got it. this one. If our end user will primarily be listening through headphones or AirPods, et cetera, but want to play it, uh, but want to play it in cars, smart speakers, and a theater situation, how should we master to binaural or as opposed to what playback mode? So, uh, so we always recommend mastering to Atmos, not specifically to binaural, because then the end device decides, oh, this person is listening on headphones we're going to decode binaurally, or that person's listening in a car, we're going to use all the capabilities of all the speakers in the car. So there's nothing special you need to worry about on the mastering side, you just create an Atmos master file. And again, once again, one of the promises of Adobe Atmos is uh, being true to creative intent. So the decoder in each individual device will decide how best to decode. So I hope that answered the question. Perfect, thank you. And another question, I've had ADM files rendered from DAPs get rejected by content distributors on ingest, uh, on in ingest QC, but DAMs, ADMs pass just fine. Lots of acronyms here. Hope everyone's keeping right. up with that. <laughs> yeah. Any difference between these ADMs are rendered, oh, sorry, any difference between how these ADMs are rendered between these two tools? Uh, no, there is not. No, uh, it's, it's they all use the same software development kit, and so they're all going to yield the same master type. Um, so specs could be its own webinar, and maybe we should have one someday. But um, different services have different deliverable specs in terms of average dialogue loudness and specifically True Peak. Um, True Peak is frankly the bane of my existence because. Uh, even in sound for picture Dolby Atmos, some studios kind of arbitrarily said, hey, the maximum true peak cannot exceed minus two dBFS. Um, we believe that is kind of a false uh, requirement because I think the concern is, hey, we don't want anything to clip or distort once it gets to consumer playback. But the thing is, the Dolby Atmos renderer um, actually has a built-in limiter that emulates what the Dolby encoder is going to do. So just to walk you through all that, when you're listening through the renderer, it's emulating, it, it's limiting in exactly the same way that the Dolby encoder that creates uh, 
Dolby digital file that gets streamed to the consumer will do. So the short version of that story is, if it's not clipping in your mix room, it's not going to clip at home. So we feel that studios telling mixers that they cannot exceed minus two dB true peak is really an arbitrary and unnecessary uh, limitation that's really not protecting anything from anybody, uh, but it is causing a lot of headaches. So, um, you know, in terms of rejected uh, deliverables, you know, simply ask the question, hey, why was this rejected? Was it true peak? Was it loudness? You know, av or average loudness there? And start there, and then we'll figure out what the answer is. And we're working with streaming services to help standardize uh, average loudness, as well as uh, advocating for less stringent uh, true peak requirements. Perfect. And Tom, I'll ask a follow-up question to that question. Would you mind help defining what an ADM is or saying out that acronym for anyone in the audience who might not know? Sure. Um, yeah, it's an ADM B-Wave, audio descriptive um, metadata. Oh, God, I'm blanking myself. But it's, okay, so I should step back. There are three different types of Dolby Atmos master files. Um, they've evolved over time. The original one is the DAMF, the Dolby Atmos Master File Package. We suck at acronym. Um, and uh, it's three separate files that travel together. It's a file name .atmos, which is kind of the table of contents. The file name .audio, which is all the audio tracks interleaved in one file. Um, and then the .metadata, which is self-explanatory. So that's a DAMF package. They have to stay together. They have to travel together. You can't rename them unless you also go into the .atmos component with a text editor and change the names inside the .atmos so that you don't break the association between the three files. Um, so the DAMF is the original file format, and it is what the Dolby Atmos renderer will write when you're creating an Atmos master in real time. Uh, the ADM B wave is an open standard. It's an ITU spec uh, broadcast wave that has a metadata header chunk with all of the metadata for the show. But it's a single self-contained file. It's the uh, file that is created if you do a non-real-time Pro Tools export. Um, and it's the file that's generated from most of the other DAWs as well. Um, and it is the file that is requested by most major services at this point. So the ADMB wave is by far the predominant Atmos master file type. And then last but not least, there is the uh, IAB, the Immersive Audio Bitstream for IMF, Interoperable Media Format. Um, and that is, like I said earlier, I think, uh, primarily used by Netflix, but some other uh, services are adapting it. Um, if for no other reason, it's a smaller file. Um, the DAMF and the ADM are both about the same size as each other. And frankly, those file types write a lot of silence. If you have an hour long show and one track has a single object on it, it's writing silence for all but that object. The IAB file actually losslessly compresses the, the, the audio by stripping out all the silence. Um, and it also streamlines the metadata a little bit. So, it's, uh, so the IAB is, because it streamlines the metadata a little bit, it's still perfectly fine as a service master, but you should not use it to ingest back into the DAW to turn it back into a session to make creative changes. However, again, it's a much, much smaller file by like orders of magnitude, so it's easier to upload, download, move around a physical plan, archive, et cetera. So that may have been way more than they were asking. Perfect. Hopefully um, that wasn't too many acronyms for everyone. Now, next is, is Apple Spatial Audio their implementation of Dolby Atmos? And that answer is yes. Yes, it is. Um, I'm going to keep moving fast because we have a lot of questions going. <laughs> Does Apple, another Apple question, does Apple currently accept Dolby Atmos for podcasting? Answer for this is no, unfortunately not. Um, but if that's something you want, we highly recommend you reach out to them um, because as you, as Tom mentioned, we can't comment on their product roadmap. I mean, we will say Apple knows how to do Dolby Atmos. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of songs on uh, Apple Music uh, that are available in Dolby Atmos. So. Uh, they absolutely know how to do it, and we'll leave it there. <laughs> and Tom, for you, how does Logic Pro's Dolby Atmos plugin compare to the Dolby Atmos production suite? Um, so the plugins aren't really a part of the production suite. The plugins 
are unique to each digital audio workstation. So the Pro Tools plugin looks different from the Resolve plugin than the uh, Apple Logic Pro plugin. It's just how uh, those DAW manufacturers have creatively decided they want to implement their panners. Um, the um, Atmos Music Panner is something that Dolby developed, um, and it has a certain special features, for example, uh, beat detection and sequencing, so you can go ins, 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 you know, around the room. Um, and that's useful for uh, some use cases, and that's installed with the uh, Dolby renderer, uh, and you can also download it separately. Um, but, but no, the different uh, panner implementations are really specific to the different digital audio workstation manufacturers and not to the Dolby renderer. Perfect. And do you have a preferred playback for Atmos mixes like Apple Music into our 7.1.4 studio rooms? Ask me that again. A preferred what again? Oh, I just lost it. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, do you have a preferred playback for Atmos mixes like Apple Music in our 7.1.4 studio rooms? In a studio? Um, gosh, it depends on if you have a professional signal path versus a consumer signal path. Um, for a consumer signal path in a studio, again, we recommend uh, doing the export to MP4 from the renderer and then just playing that file through a disc player or a smart TV into your sound bar or your AV receiver. Uh, for a professional workflow, uh, we always recommend going through the renderer, either the native renderer in the other DAWs or uh, the, uh, the Dolby renderer uh, specifically for Pro Tools. So I, I hope that answered the question. I think so, I think All so. Right, now, do you have advice on how to get my foot in the door for podcast mixing? That is a great question. Um, you know, if you have uh, contacts at the uh, uh, Atmos Capable Services, absolutely reach out. If you know creatives, companies who are actually, um, you know, creating high-end podcasts, uh, reach out to those folks. Uh, but specifically, uh, part of the reason we're here with Pod People is that we want to help do some matchmaking, and I think Pod People has great contacts between mixers and the uh, creative community so that uh, they can do some matchmaking if the services reach out to pod people are going, hey, uh, can you refer us to some talented folks? Uh, I think they're, uh, they will make that happen. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um, there's a link in the chat, but if you want to join pod people as a community member, uh, I believe the website is www.podpeople.com slash join, um, and feel free to join the community. They're amazing. And also join uh, the other online communities. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the uh, Atmos Mixing Professionals uh, group on Facebook uh, and other social media. There's, uh, in fact, there's Atmos Post Mixing Professionals and Atmos Music Mixing Professionals. And, you know, there's a great wealth of talent and information sharing uh, in those forums. Right. What am I hearing when I listen to a Dolby Atmos podcast on Wondery with AirPods Max? an Apple spatial rendering of an Atmos ADM or DAMP? Uh, well, you're, so the ADM or the DAMP gets encoded into Dolby Digital Plus, which is our you know, constant bit rate consumer-facing codec, and DD Plus is what goes out to you, and then uh, the uh, Apple device decodes it and applies you know, a little bit of their own uh, spatial audio special sauce. So it is, it is a Dolby Atmos encoded stream, with uh, Apple, uh, you know, special processing. So yes, you are listening to Dolby Atmos, whoever yes. asked that question. Um, this is a fun question, I don't know the answer to this. Any book available to learn Dolby Atmos, to learn more about Dolby Atmos? I don't know if there's a book, but we do have yeah, a ton well, of well, online. you should write one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what is it, Rutledge or Routledge Publishing, um, so I, I will uh, confess uh, a friend of mine, uh, Cheryl Ottenritter, has co-written a book about audio mixing, and there is a module uh, about uh, Dolby Atmos. So uh, Routledge Publishing, it's a you know, boutique mail order publisher, and uh, search for the name Cheryl Ottenritter, and uh, that book has some great info in it. Great. Um, oh, I should also mention, um, or, you know, there, there are several different training curriculums for uh, learning how to mix Dolby Atmos. Um, one of them is, uh, so Avid actually teaches a Pro Tools specific course 
um, and it is uh, partially self-taught, partially instructor-led, and at the end of it, um, you do get, a, you know, you are certified by Avid as an Atlas mixer. Uh, there is a cost for that. Uh, also on uh, learning.dolby.com, although I think we're porting it over to another URL, but you'll be able to find it. Um, learning.dolby.com has a fully self-guided training curriculum uh, with sample content that you can download. And so that's also a great resource for uh, learning how to mix an Atmos. It's also largely Pro Tools focused, but there are some modules that address the other DAWs as well. Um, next question. Um, how does not having an MTRX studio affect producing in Dolby Atmos? Well, um, you, you know, there, there are lots of different um, hardware configurations that you can use to build your mixing studio, and, and I don't claim to be an expert or to have a preference in, you know, which devices. You know, when we did a podcast movement in um, – uh, in uh, Dallas uh, just a couple weeks ago, we used a speaker system with a, um, a Focusrite uh, Red uh, 16 line, and that was the I.O., and it went directly to the speakers. So it was laptop to the Focusrite I.O., directly to the speakers, and that's a great solution. Uh, Avid uh, MTRX products are, you know, they're first class, and if you have the budget for that, awesome. Um, but honestly, uh, you know, use what fits your budget and use what you like. Great. And someone in the chat put in uh, the ADM acronym, Audio Definition Model. So thank you for whoever, whoever put that in the chat. Appreciate <laughs> thank it. you kindly. Now, what we'll about that eventually? Yeah. <laughs> right after <laughs> we click end, I would have gone, ah. Right, right. Okay, one more before we run out of time, or maybe we'll try and fit in a few. What effect could a smaller 7.1.4 system have on my mixes? My room is currently a five-foot radius, which is undersized to spec. Uh, what effect will it have if you have a full 714? Um, it's, I mean, it will be tight, but, you know, if if your volumes are set appropriately, if you pick your speakers for the listening position, I still think it will be a pleasing effect. I mean, you could also mix 514. Maybe you don't need 714 in that small a footprint, but if you have 714, just calibrate and, uh, you know, loudness uh, level your speakers appropriately, and it'll still be a great experience. Perfect. And uh, from Kyle, for podcasters without a larger network, any work with podcast clients on smartphones to support MP4 files with DD plus Jock Atmos as a secondary audio track? So it's for podcasters without a larger network. Um, I don't think I actually quite understand this question. Yeah, I'm a little fuzzy myself. Uh, as I reread. Um, so again, you don't necessarily if you want to QC something on a phone, you don't need to um, to get it posted to a, a podcast platform. You can sideload directly to the phone and listen that way. Yes, yes, maybe that's what they're asking. Um, and if you have a smaller app, you technically could enable your app yourself. Just because uh, you're on your iPhone, you have the Dolby Atmos technology in, in there. All right, well, let's see what else we have. See if we can fit one more, and then I'll throw the mic back to Matt. Can you tell us if this tech are going to other mainstream platforms like Spotify, and also, uh, and also which is the file you have to deliver to this platform? So I think like Tom answered, we can't comment on their roadmap yet, but stay tuned for some new announcements. Yep. And let's see if we can fit one again, more. And typically what is delivered is the master file, the ADM B-Wave. What oh, are did, the options? Oh, I'm sorry, real quick, Aisha. Um, if you're doing real-time print mastering with the Dolby Renderer product and you get the, you know, that creates a damp, but what you need to deliver is an ADM. Again, remember the free Dolby Atmos conversion tool you import the DAMP, you hit export to ADM, and it creates the ADM for you. Okay. Um, all right. And is there a way to play around with um, a short movie, ADM uh, B-Wave file just shown in Pro Tools? Oh, I think they're talking about Escape. Um, so there, uh, again, there is sample content on uh, learning.dolby.com, but also a great resource, although it's sound for picture, 
um, at uh, opencontentitthink.netflix.com. Uh, there's some great stuff there, including a, uh, a computer animated piece uh, called Soul Levante. It was uh, sound designed and mixed by Will Files. It's a really neat piece. Um, and Netflix offers that up for free for creatives to download the uh, Atlas Master file, the companion proxy video. And it's a great piece that you can put into uh, your digital audio workstation and kick it around. So that's a great resource to see how someone has done a really bonkers, you know, complex Dolby Atmos mix. Fantastic, thanks Tom. And now I'll throw the mic back, back to Matt. He wants to jump on camera for some closing All remarks. Right. Well, thank you to the hundred of you who joined us today for this presentation. Um, and thank you to Tom and Aisha. That was such a fantastic overview of Dolby Atmos. Um, Tom, funny enough, you had joked at some point in the presentation that there was the Tesla and Kia version of the production <laughs> tools, but to me, it's all Rolls Royce. It's absolutely awesome. incredible what you all have done. Um, oh, gosh, I think, thank you. Yeah, I think what's really coolest about it is that you are doing such great work to democratize the availability of this technology, um, both with the price point, uh, the fact that it works across so many DAWs, uh, and the fact that you can start mixing on headphones is just so fantastic. Uh, really opens up this technology to so many folks out there. Um, and lucky for everyone here, uh, we'll be sending out tomorrow uh, a 90-day free trial for Dolby Atmos so you can all get started. Uh, we'll also be including that information to join Pod People. Um, though if you're really raring to go, you can head to podpeople.com slash join. Uh, and again, you'll be getting newsletters, more events and workshops like this, uh, and access to our social networking platform, Circle. Um, so for whomever it was that said that they wanted to break into mixing, uh, if you get on Circle, you can chat with other industry pros, uh, learn about you know the tech side, learn about how to break in the business and more. Um, lastly, with that email coming tomorrow, we'll be sending you info on our second event uh, with Dolby, which is Wednesday, October 26 at 3.30 p.m. Uh, PT, that's 6.30 p.m. ET. Um, and in this uh, next event, we'll be chatting with CJ Drumler, uh, who's a Emmy Award winning sound designer, composer, and mixer who works with Dolby Atmos technology and can answer a lot more um, questions and we'll have some really great insights uh, about uh, CJ's workflow. So um, thank you to everyone on Pod People and Dolby who helped set up this event and uh, we hope to see you on the 26th. Thank you, All Matt. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.